what is the primary use uh, for for the developers? Core generation does not work great. Yeah, for simple stuff it works great, but for actual practical use from a project, it does not work great because. Hello everyone and welcome back to Hackcast season number four. We are so happy to be back and we are so happy to be back with you again. And as you can see, we are in our Hackcast studio, but it has improved. And it has improved by a lot. If you're interested at everything new that's happening in the studio, write in the comments. We may decide to uh, create a video or some kind of content about the new studio. So if you're interested, just comment below. Yeah, Teddy was Teddy was relentless for the past month and everything is looking really, really professional. Uh, so yeah, drop us a comment if you want to see more about our new studio. And for the fourth season, of course, we will continue talking about software development, software engineering, the business side of running a software development company. Uh, Hackcast is the official podcast of Hacksoft, which is a software development company. But we have something very, very special for the fourth season. We will be having guests for every single episode of the new season. Yes, we will have guests and we have a guest right now. Our very first guest for our very first episode of season number four is Doncho Minkov. Say Hello. Hi, Doncho. Hello. Uh, most probably, you know Doncho. He's one of the OG technical trainers back from Telerik Academy, from the very first cohorts of Telerik Academy. How I, long? How long uh, have you been doing this, don't you? Uh, Tell us more about it. Actually, I was from the first cohort, not one of the first. I was actually the very first. Okay. That was 13 years ago. Uh, back in 2010, I started. I was there training to be a developer, and uh, Svetlina Kuf showed, and. It was really strange because back then I was ready, like mentally, like um, everything was, uh, I was uh, heading in the direction of software development and Nakov just appeared and uh, mm -hmm. in the room and said, does anybody want to be a, uh, a trainer, sorry, a technical trainer to work with me and so on and so on. And the rest is history. Yeah. So, so you were uh, part of the first cohort and then Nakov asked uh, who wants to be a trainer and you said, yeah, yeah, exactly like that. And uh, two of us, we are, we were a very small group back then. Mm. We were like uh, 14 or 15, something like that. Oh, wow. Very small group. Yeah. And two of us uh, auditioned for the technical trainer role and Nakov chose me. And uh, I think it was July, something like that. So more than 13 years. More than 13 years. Well, yeah. And this does not mean that we are old. We're actually quite young, but we just also started quite young. So <laughs> yeah. 13 years is nothing. And uh, by the way, Ivo, you, you have a story with Doncho. Yeah, Doncho was actually my, my first teacher in the academy. I was participating in C Sharp uh, Fundamentals 1 and C Sharp Fundamentals 2. One oh, of my nice. favorite teachers in the Telerik Academy back then. Yeah, thank you, Ivo. Yeah, so the, basically, don't you? Uh, he's like responsible. He and the the rest of the Telerik Academy back then crew for teaching so many developers that actually found a job after this and built a better life for them. So, uh, kudos, don't you, for for doing all of this? Thank you. Uh, thank you. This should really be appreciated because it, I, I know it means a lot for a lot of people. Yeah. And uh, I believe you're still doing this uh, now in Softony. Yeah. Uh, you're still a technical trainer. Yeah. Uh, I'm still a te technical trainer, but not to the extent that uh, I once was. Yeah. Because for a lot of years, my primary job was technical training, and my and I was developer like a side job. Uh, I would say something like seventy to thirty percent. Uh, now it's uh, one hundred development, and on top of that, I do a little training, like uh, three months a year, something like that. Okay. Uh, both because I like it. I like being a trainer. I like uh, spreading knowledge, mentoring people and so on and so on. And, uh, also because, uh, as you said, I'm kind of, uh, one of the first trainers and, mm -hmm. uh, they constantly ask me to uh, do courses <laughs> and it just, uh, becomes kind of hard to say no anymore. All right. yeah. yeah. And uh, don't you uh, been training people with uh, Python and Django that we actually yeah. hired at Hacksoft and they also speak very, very fondly of him. Uh, I think Great. we have two or three uh, people from, from there. So, yeah. for that. Yeah. 
Great. And right now you are director of engineering at Ambition. Mm -hmm. So please tell us more about this. Yeah, well, as I said, I started as a technical trainer, uh, like full-time job. Then I switched to being a software developer, went through the management part where you have the, uh, like, um, you have this change when you write code uh, all, all the all day, and then you write code just a little parts of the day. Mm. And yeah, I decided I have to, I, I want to change to experiment with something else. And now I'm doing pretty much only technical, tra uh, technical, like how you say it, leadership. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Now we are ambition. We are a very young company. I think we are like, I actually forgot because it felt so long time ago that we started so many things happens, but I think it was one year. Uh, Something like this, it feels like. Yeah. Like I remember we, having a lunch with you here in yeah. the place already closed because it's, they don't offer shisha in Studensky, right? But we had uh, lunch <laughs> and uh, you were just, uh, yeah. you were just uh, not starting, but uh, setting things up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but as I said, it, it feels so long time ago, not just a year, because a lot of things happened. We have a lot of change in responsibilities. Now I have to do a lot of different things that I've done uh, for 13 years, as I said. Mm -hmm. And yeah, now uh, I have to make decisions that I haven't done before, or at least I was not responsible. More, maybe that's the word, not uh, right. done, but responsible for. Like, uh, how do you... Um, how do you like grow your team? How okay. uh, people um, work inside the team? Uh, and I don't, I don't mean on a team level because on team level, yeah, you do this. Uh, uh, why we are like a team leader? Yeah, mm -hmm. we are people manager. I mean on a higher level. Uh, you think where this person is feeling best in this team or this team? Uh, what he wants to learn, what uh, he wants to achieve, and stuff yep. like that. So you kind of overlook operations uh, towards engineering, uh, development, the teams. Uh, do, do, do you work with clients? Like, are you exposed to, to end clients or not as much? Well, kind of. As I said, we are pretty young. Yeah. Uh, so everybody does everything. Uh, that means that I also talk to clients. We don't have another like technical expert that we can um, send to meetings to yeah. evaluate projects or uh, do the technical technical requirements. So yeah, as I do that, but to be fair, I prefer not to do it because- uh, that's, that's great. Yeah, if you know, if you if you are aware of it, yeah, yeah, I just know that there are people in our company that do this better than me, and uh, I think for the company, uh, it's better to do the things to be done by the person that can do them the best. Yeah. yeah. Do you write a lot of code nowadays? No. Do you write Do you write any code nowadays? No. Okay. Did you miss writing code nowadays? Let's put uh, it this way. I do miss it a little. Uh, actually, I write a little code, but it's like for side projects. Right. Uh, right. During work, I don't write code because I think that's a very important thing when you uh, grow in a position that mm. you have to know what you are supposed to do and uh, what you want to do. And I can write code, maybe I can write a lot of code for our project, but that's not the place that I will be like most valuable at. Yeah. Yeah. So I refrain from writing code. If the if the need arises, yeah, I step on and write the code. But uh, I I'm trying to leave the people that want to write the code, and it's their responsibility to write the code to do it. But I still help. I see a lot of code nowadays. Uh, I'm not writing it, but we are discussing it. We are like. Um, discussing ideas, uh, solutions, and so on and so on. So your position now is deeply technical. However, you're not writing the code, but other people are doing it. Yeah. He's enabling, he's enabling the, the teams uh, in the company to yeah. be better. Yeah. Uh, this, is yeah. how, this is how I understand it. Uh, yeah. yeah, something like that, yeah. And there was a, there was a question in uh, the last episode of the last season for how can you scale from working as a single person on a project to actually having having a company. I think don't you just provide it uh, the best answer for it, like refrain from doing the 
the, the work and be more of an enabler for the rest of the folks so you can actually scale and grow. Otherwise, you're just a bottleneck. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And thank you, Doncho. Uh, Teddy, I'm sorry, I promised a lot of episodes. Everything's good with the recording. I promise. Uh, I tend to promise uh, future episodes uh, of the of the podcast for for uh, various topics. But we will do a nostalgia episode at some point where we will uh, reminisce with uh, Doncho and perhaps other folks for the good old days where uh, everything was just starting. Uh, Telerik yeah. Academy was just starting and stuff like this. Uh, so that's Doncho and. For this particular episode, we invited him, we invited Don't you to talk about practical use of modern AI, artificial intelligence in software development. And by practical use, I mean, uh, we are running a software development company, we are using AI, you are running mm -hmm. a software development company, you are using AI, and you're actually quite active on LinkedIn, sharing things uh, that you learn and mm -hmm. insights, which is great. And we want to focus this episode on the practicality like let's talk about our day-to-day -day work and the tools that we use in our day-to-day -day work and the observations that we have in our our day-to-day -day work future episodes we can do something more theoretical but let's keep it pragmatic and practical for this episode great and uh there are plenty of tools and we just have to start somewhere we will go into more details for each of the tools but don't show let's start somewhere what are you using currently for your day-to-day -day job and the day-to-day -day job of, of the folks working at Ambitions uh, from the set of, uh, I think right now I can say, infinite amount of uh, AI tools yeah. out there? Yeah. Well, I'll start with the obvious uh, thing. We use a lot of AI chatbots. All right. Uh, like ChatGPT quote, I think it's pronounced quote. We actually discussed it before before the... Yeah. Yeah. I think it's quote because it's French. Never mind. Um, I tried also Bart, but uh, to be fair, I'm not impressed with Bart. So mm -hmm. I just give it a try once, uh, once a few weeks. Uh, we also use uh, other things like Copilot, like uh, Tab9. All right. And from then on, it depends on the job you do. Uh, actually, I I use a lot of Grammarly and DeepL um, because um, this is. As I said earlier, I'm not writing a lot of code, yep. so I'm writing a lot of letters, uh, like emails, uh, documentation, and so on and so on. And I don't have uh, much use from Copilot. All right, but, yeah, <laughs> that's interesting. Okay, so let's let's pick the the like the biggest one, the most popular tool out there is ChatGPT. Of course, this yeah. this is the thing that started uh all, all of this yeah. so uh, how do you use and how do you leverage ChatGPT in the software development day-to-day -day work that's very very interesting topic because for the past like six months something like that uh we've been experimenting a lot with a lot of ai tools why because uh, as i already said we are still young and we can like um we can do it yeah. uh, it's allowed still to do it <laughs> yeah and yeah, so ChatGPT, as you said, uh, is the most popular one, the thing that started it all. And of course, it's uh, the, most, the most used tool. ChatGPT, by ChatGPT, I mean the uh, premium version. Was it plus or premium? I'm not sure. The, the paid one. The subscribe, yeah. the paid okay, one. Yeah. So do you, do you have like a single subscription or everyone at the company has a subscription? How, how, do, you, how do you do it? Uh, now for now we are using two subscriptions for okay. the for the teams and we have a rule that everybody that has a management role uh, has uh, his separate uh, subscription all right. all right the idea is be behind that is that uh, every person that has some uh, people management uh, responsibilities has to um, to keep the information about people like for themselves and it's not okay to be shared but for the developers, uh, actually, we started with four, four, right. four accounts for okay. like 10 developers, something like that. But uh, through the months, uh, ChatGPT increased their messages per uh, two hours, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And um, our developers started, uh, they become more proficient with working with ChatGPT and like prompt engineering. Right. And um, actually, we didn't need more. Uh, that's why we shrunk. We start okay. with four, now we're using two. 
Yeah. So are, are, are just just uh, out of curiosity, are, do you have like a ChatGPT one at ambition.com and ChatGPT two at ambition.com for emails or? Yes, but it's devs one and okay, devs okay. two. <laughs> yeah. We we do have a Verso uh, uh, at hacksoft.io, but that's that's a, diff <laughs> that's a different topic. <laughs> All right, so you use the paid version uh, of uh, ChatGPT. I call it ChatGPT four, but whatever, yeah. whatever they they call it right now. So, what is the primary use that, uh, for for the developers? Is it code generation, or I'm really curious, what's the primary use? Uh, to be fair, code generation does not work great from uh, my end. Uh, their uh, feedback. Mm. Uh, it just doesn't. Yeah, for simple stuff, it works great. If you ask uh, ChatGPT to reverse a binary tree or write a merge sort, uh, it will do it, yeah. yeah. But for actual practical use from a project, it does not work great because uh, it just can't grasp the, um, the whole context of the application. Yeah. yeah. So, no, we don't use it to, to generate okay. code, okay. but everything else that is... Um, around the um, the writing of the code, of the coding itself, meaning that we use it to uh, generate documentation. It's actually pretty good with uh, generating right. documentation, writing tests, and explaining stuff. Actually, a funny story, it's not a story, it's um, one of the successful experiments with AI that we've, uh, we've done uh, past months, is that we had a girl that have just finished an academy and um, we heard her like a mm -hmm. junior developer and uh, we are really transparent about this that we want to try to introduce something like an AI mentor. Yeah, you yeah. wrote about this on LinkedIn. There yeah, was a post. Yeah. Right, yeah. yeah, on Medium. It's not very popular on Medium, but still, yeah. Anyway, uh, we have AI mentor and the uh, there were really simple rules. She had a mentor that is uh, from the team, uh, experienced developer, but we asked her to ask the chat, the, to ask the AI chatbots everything that she doesn't know. And once, um, once she gets an answer, she has to judge, is it okay? If it's not okay, she talks to me. So I was part of the mentoring as well. All right. And it turned actually pretty well. So if someone let's say a junior junior developer yeah. stumbles upon something or just has a question or something's not working the first thing that what we usually do is google it but you say uh use chat gpt to try to mm -hmm. explain and frame your problem and only if you don't find or understand the solution then reach to a human yeah but before reaching to the human we have another additional step that we try to um like modify the prompt right. to see if uh, the problem is the prompt or ChatGPT can't. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. okay. So, yeah. so this is before reaching human or after reaching it? Or uh, while, while reaching Before it? reaching the mentor. So okay. we have the junior developer. Uh, she tries to ask ChatGPT. Okay. Uh, if uh, ChatGPT does not answer correctly, then she asks me. I was like the middleman. All right. For, you had yeah. Middleman. Yeah. And if I say that, yeah, ChatGPT can't answer that. Mm -hmm. Then, then she goes to the mentor. Yeah, perhaps. Uh, do you have something to add? Yeah, and and the idea here is to help her improve her uh, prompt uh, engineering skills to 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 ask better and uh, form her questions in in a better way, so she can so she can so she can get answers. Yeah, uh, that was my part. Okay, yeah, yeah, the middleman. The whole idea is that. Um, from my experience, a lot of juniors uh, are like afraid to ask the so-called dumb questions. Mm -hmm. And to be fair, sometimes they are dumb, yeah. uh, but they have to ask them. And uh, there is a lot of anxiety when a junior developer uh, has to ask something like that, a real person. And ChatGPT or AI in general, uh, for better or for worse, uh, has no morality. So uh, you can ask him, Ask yeah, ChatGPT yeah, yeah. anything and it will just answer. Got it. Yeah, that's. Uh, I, I I remember reading this uh, either LinkedIn or, yeah. or Medium, and I was thinking to myself, okay, this sounds like a good idea, but with uh, like at the moment, I saw two two particular programs uh, that I wanted to ask you about, and yeah, now, now we have uh, this opportunity. And the first one is uh, let's say the junior 
asks ChatGPT and gets an answer and says, all right, my, uh, my problem is solved, but ChatGPT provided something that, so the problem uh, was not framed in the correct way, but let's say the junior was solving the wrong problem and got the solution for the wrong problem and continued working, but with perhaps uh, moving in the, in the wrong direction. H how do you address this? Uh, because from our experience, this is for, with juniors and interns, their biggest problem is they are solving the, the, the wrong problems a, and they don't know that. Yeah, yeah uh, but but that's something that a junior developer will do anyway. Doesn't matter if it's ChatGPT or uh, he or is she. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they always solve the wrong problem. This way, they won't feel bad for solving the, the wrong problem because no, I'm not saying it right. Um, let's uh, let's play it like this. I'm a junior developer and I'm asking you as a mentor, right? Yeah. Uh, and you answer me and you think you have answered me very good, very detailed, yeah. but I'm a junior and I am shy. I, I know I don't know anything. So I like agree with you. Yeah, I understood everything. And actually I haven't understood everything. So yeah. I try to solve the different different problem. And and then it's even harder to go back to the mentor and say, hey, you remember that I said I understood everything actually. Yeah. No. <laughs> so yeah. Let's start again. Yeah. But if you do this with an AI, mm -hmm. you are not ashamed to ask it again. Why? Because it's AI, as I said, it has no morality, it will be fair, won't laugh at you if you want, anything like that. Okay. This is, this is interesting. This is interesting framing because I think if you are, if you have some kind of anxiety talking to a human. I'm not 100% uh, sure about this, uh, it's just an intuition, but you might have as well anxiety to ask uh, the AI. And it's not because it's an AI, but it's because the anxiety comes from you thinking that you should know something for in order to be in this position, but you actually don't know it. And this creates the anxiety and asking for help just increases your anxiety mm -hmm. at least this is this is what i've seen from uh from our folks here and the way that we address this is by first uh, of course talking a lot and uh, some somehow dumping down ourselves just presenting ourselves as just another human that you can ask this dumb question doesn't matter we are we are basically the same and uh doing this over uh, a long period of time usually for juniors and interns here is six months and that's uh, this, this is what i was thinking how do you after this train those juniors to actually talk with humans if they uh, get used to asking questions to ais and googles no, no, they talk with the mentor all the time. Okay. Like the AI mentor is only augmenting uh, okay. the real mentor. Uh, we don't want to break this connection with um, people to person to person, uh, person to person communication, but it's open. It's out there to ask the AI, AI as I said, the dumb questions or explaining. It's actually yeah. really good for explaining stuff. Or for example, if you're a junior, you've uh, learned something like Django doesn't yeah. matter and you have to do front end and you know the basics of JavaScript, but you have to start doing React mm. and you see a lot of uh, hard code in the code base already and you just can't understand it. You can just copy and paste it to a uh, chatbot and it will explain to yeah, you. Yeah, got it. To, to understand the framework, basically, hey, uh, this there are some strange things here from the React code base that I haven't seen. Yeah. As we had an, <laughs> as we had an example, uh, we have folks who learned React here with hooks, like they mm -hmm. learned React with hooks and they're very good with hooks and they had to jump in a code base where we still had class components. Okay, okay, yeah. <laughs> it was a really interesting experience because you had to explain it backwards. And now, I, now that I'm uh, thinking through it, perhaps ChatGPT could have helped a lot here because mm. you can just say, hey, I have only knowledge about React hooks and here's a example um, class-based code. Can you navigate me through it? Yeah, you can do that. Okay, that's smart. To be fair, uh, in the case with React, I mean, class base uh, views, uh, no, not views, uh, sorry. Uh, components. 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 Components, yeah, thank you. Uh, with the case with class, uh, class based components in React, actually, ChatGPT performs better with class based 
components because uh, because of its data. Yeah. Yeah. There's more uh, class based code base yeah. out there. Yeah. Com class based yeah. components, code base out there. Yeah. All right. So okay. This is this is actually then smart. If my, my, my general problem was the lack of human connection, uh, because juniors need to learn to talk mm. with other people. But if you're not breaking this, then it's very valuable to teach them the the necessary skills because we were joking that sometimes we have to teach people how to Google, but this is basically the same thing. Yeah. yeah. How to frame your questions so you can find a proper answer or a good direction yeah, to your yeah. answer. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, so you said you don't use it for code generation. You use it for uh, the, the very thing that we just uh, discussed. Anything else about ChatGPT in software development uh, context? Yeah, of course. Uh, well, we use it for documentation. No developer like, likes to write documentation. So this solves a lot of problems then. What kind of documentation? Uh, in code documentation. So, so, so the person reading this documentation is another developer that is... Yeah reading the code yeah and the document and the code documentation i have tried it actually quote not chat gpt because uh the chat gpt now has uh data analysis to upload files uh but it doesn't work great with dotnet code and we use dotnet so mm. Uh, mm. it tries to do some um regular expressions stuff to understand the code that it just doesn't yeah um so I, I used quote. Okay. Uh, quote uh, has a uh, file report from, I don't know, many months now. Still, it still has it. Mm. And then you can upload all the code and just ask him, write me uh, domain knowledge documentation that will be all right. uh, uh, read by other people, not, not technical people. The problem here is that uh, the context of quote is not that big. That's actually the problem because uh, it works on a different um, uh, different way than ChatGPT. ChatGPT just forgets stuff uh, that is like at the top of the conversation. Yeah. And once you reach the uh, context window in quote, it just tells you, ah, context uh, done. You can't continue. So you have to start over again, but with a different context. Yeah, but if you have a watch code base, you just mm -hmm. can't do that. And I tried it, it works really nice. Uh, for a very small package that we were developing. Uh, actually, it's more, it's um, a lot like the Django admin bar for .NET. Okay. And as it's, it's, a, it's a package, it's not that big mm. and you can upload all the code and it was great. But yeah. Awesome. I'll, I'll come back to, to uploading the code to Cloud. Okay. We, have, uh, we have a point to address here uh, because it's, it's quite uh, important uh, okay. the, for, for the practical sense of things. Uh, my experience, uh, I'll share some tips, not not tips, but what I use uh, ChatGPT for uh, for mm -hmm. software development is, first of all, explaining regular expressions. It's great. And I never learned them. I actually learned them like 15 times or 20 yeah. times. Never actually exactly. got, exactly. got the yeah. correct intuition. And it's really good at explaining and writing them and writing, generating, for example, tests that help you cover, cover the, mm. the regular expressions. I use it a lot for uh, manipulating CSV data, like a lot. Okay. Here's the CSV because I just don't want to write the Python or Pandas code for this. And just, just please, give, here's the CSV, change this column to this and add another column and do this. And it's it's doing a really, really good job uh, and this okay. saves a lot of time. And what I really, really like about ChatGPT because we, we had an episode back in season season three or season two season three about AI. And uh, my general good feeling back then was, okay, ChatGPT feels like Google with extra steps. Mm. Meaning if I have to search for some particular topic uh, and I don't have ChatGPT, I Google it. I then open 10 to 15 pages. I start reading and I start taking down notes in a separate document. And it's like an ongoing process. And what I felt back then is that ChatGPT is doing all those steps for me and it's presenting yeah. me with it, with the final content. Yeah. Uh, but the, the, the actual, the, the power for me is that it, it can generate content that never existed before mm. based on, based on, uh, based on the knowledge that, that it, that it has. For example, we have right now a PHP project. Okay. We, are, we, we took, uh, 
very good clients, uh, and it's PHP. And we have a team that's working with PHP. We, we have, we are PHP OGs, which <laughs> we always started. Back in PHP. the days. Yeah, back yeah. in the days. And ChatGPT is just ex extremely powerful for, hey, in Django, we have something that's called prefetch related that does yeah. this thing. Yeah. How, I'm not going to swear, how do I do this in Waravel? And it just gives me an example. And this is super powerful because it saves me the time to search in Stack Overflow or uh, for some kind of a blog post where someone explains this. And yeah. there's like a very little chance for someone to explain cr cross Django, cross Waravel uh, things that, that match. And for me, this is extremely powerful. Yeah. And it's solving another problem. A huge problem to me is that whenever I Google something, nowadays I'm the first couple of search results are just big wonk articles that are specifically written for SEO purpose in order for you to go there, agree with a couple cookie uh, yeah. pop-ups so you can dig there and find your answer that is basically three lines of example code. I don't know why, why Google is failing so much with showing you the right content that's answering your question. They have to sell ads and this is yeah. also a problem that uh, ChatGPT is going to have. Mm. Probably, yeah, but, but for now, for simple technical questions that you should be that you should know the answer but you probably forgot it is way faster to me to receive the right answer instead of googling it and going to a couple articles that are really long with a lot of content that's not supposed to be there it's just there for the word count and for the yeah. uh, keywords count and and so on yeah yeah and research, you know, I, I don't want to discard Google yet, but uh, sometimes when I have to start researching a topic that I have no idea about, for example, how do I implement uh, a Wix uh, plugin okay. for Wix e-commerce? Right. I can Google it, but they have like tons of documentation and... I, You're just lost there, you know. I, I want to be pointed in the right direction. And then I start with ChatGPT. It gives me proper terms which after this i used to craft a better query for google and then i found what, what i need yeah yeah uh, but for sure i don't want to discard google yet you know for some of the things at least i'm uh, i'm quite um what's the word for it i don't trust everything that chat gpt writes to exactly me. yeah basically i trust nothing but then you can validate with the rest of the internet yeah, yeah. the the the, the wings example is kind of uh good because it's Imagine some things that were not true, and our research was some kind somehow based on things that are not exactly true. I, I wrote an offer to a client based only on ChatGPT, which turned out to be uh, hallucinating about a very important specific thing. Uh, luckily, okay. we didn't got the client okay. <laughs> because okay. we thought, "Oh, this is this is really really fast." And ChatGPT hallucinated something that if this thing actually existed, it's going to be really fast to implement it. But yeah, it didn't exist. It didn't. Okay, okay, interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's uh, from my experience. It's also very nice, uh, very good at researching. You can use it to compare stuff. Mm. I actually used it last week to uh, find a gun charger. Uh, I know if you know it's, what's a gun charger. Well, it's a charger that you put in the uh, socket, and uh, you can get uh, multiple cables going out from it. Uh, with, well, I can explain more. If uh, please do so. Yeah. Yeah, it's a charger that uh, uh, that is not a silicon technology. It uses something else. I'm not that good with uh, right. chemistry and stuff, uh, and mechanics. But basically, uh, you have a, a a lot less loss of energy. So this way you can charge multiple devices together without losing the energy uh, from for example heating the device all right and uh, as i said i don't understand this stuff i'm a techie but this is like a, a new thing and i haven't delved in it and i wanted to buy one for um, uh, for a trip i'm going to this week so i have to i, I didn't have the time to do a thorough research uh, through all the uh, stuff and ChatGPT actually pointed me to the uh, to the right. This was using the browsing uh, plugin. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's using the browsing plugin, and it even uh, sent me, asked him to uh, to find me the top ten gun chargers out there that I can buy in Europe, and um, 
have at least something like one one hundred uh, watts of power, something like that. I don't remember the actual prompt, Got it. but yes. And uh, also to find the review reviews on these devices and like mm -hmm. summarize the information. And it actually proved very nice because uh, I did a very quick research after that, and actually the things that it suggested were the top uh, devices nice. out there. Okay, so uh, my takeaway is uh, we should use uh, ChatGPT more, I suppose. Yeah, sure. It can do it can do this this is an interesting uh, approach. Yeah, and let's just summarize. So far, you're using it as uh, like uh, augmentation to your to the mentorship that you're doing at the company. Uh, not not as much for call generation. And mm. I can understand this. It's we will talk about Copilot next. Um, you use it for explanation and for generating documentation and for research which is yeah powerful. i also use Anything it else? For, yeah, yeah actually a lot more else <laughs> i use a uh, chat gpt a lot and uh, i'm like trying to motivate the team to use it even more uh, i use it also as a validator of ideas uh, there was more yeah if you have uh, some kind of idea and you have two or three ways you can think of, of uh, like implementing it. Doesn't matter if it's actual code or something else. You can use it as um, like, like um, uh, how do you say it? Like the, part or the participant mm. uh, that can argue with you. And you can say to, to the chatbot, act as, for example, a CEO or act as a technical leader or act as everybody. Give me the perspective of, uh, for example, the CEO of a potential client mm. and and so on and so on. And the things it writes, it generates, uh, sometimes they're not good, as you as you said as well, but um, it's it's still good for brainstorming. You can, yeah, br brainstorming is actually the word. You can brainstorm with it. I use it a lot of uh, a lot in my posts. When I write a post, actually the posts are not AI generated, but I use AI to like validate them mm. uh, for the target audience. Um, I use them to uh, tell me what are the like. Uh, what are the feelings of the audience after they read it and stuff like that? Um, okay. Yeah. For things like that, I use it a lot. And let me think of something. I said a lot of things. Do, do you do you validate the the results uh, based on because if I ask ChatGPT, hey, how how would the audience feel about this? Uh, I know I'm, I'm I kind of won't trust the response because ChatGPT does not know my audience. Do you kind of validate how the audience reacted with what ChatGPT said to you back? I'm planning to do it, yeah. uh, like a thorough, um, thorough, uh, how do you say it? Uh, thoroughly try. Thoroughly, like e e in yeah. its entire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, it takes a lot of time, yeah. so I've, I haven't done it already. But uh, I do it from time to time for single okay. posts, and it's fine. As you said, it's hard to predict what will the what will be the reaction of the audience. But still, if there is something very obvious that you can't see because you're the author, and I have okay. written this post like 15 minutes ago, I don't see it actually, obviously, and it can say, "Yeah, this is this is not okay." For example, uh, I know. Two weeks ago, I wrote on a quote about st uh, static analysis. It doesn't matter that much, but I wrote something like static analysis is God. And in the modern world, ChatGPT said, yeah, you can't use God here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Too controversial. Yeah, you have to use something else. And I said, okay, static analysis is king. And he said, oh, that's not okay because why it's not queen? And so on and so yeah, on. Yeah, okay. Makes yeah. you, okay, got it. Gives you back things to think about. Yeah, like the most scandalous stuff. Scandalous is not the word. The most uh, controversial. Be, yeah, controversial stuff. Right. Uh, it finds it. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So basically, ChatGPT can be your co-pilot. Uh, no yeah. pun intended. And this gives us a great transition about um, uh, GitHub's co-pilot. 
uh, because we are talking about the practical use of AI in modern software development, mm. uh, modern AI tools in software development. And at least for me, uh, Copilot is for software development, for day-to-day -day use, the best tool out there. Uh, we actually have a company policy, everyone who wants to use it, and I think it's almost everyone at the company. Almost, yeah. We have a GitHub uh, organization and we, we have Copilot for business. And everyone has, if, if they want to, has Copilot running uh, right. to, to aid them in their day-to-day -day job. And back when uh, Copilot first uh, was released, I was a big skeptic because I was uh, using Vim back then. Mm. And let's say I, I liked to type <laughs> sometimes, but then I gave it a try uh, in VS Code. And I don't know what the GitHub and Microsoft engineers have done, but it's really, really helpful because for me, and it's not helpful when I ask it, generate me something like I mm don't like using it like ChatGPT, generate me something mm. based on it, but rather just observe the context of the code base that I'm writing and help me how to complete things in a smart way following the context. And I think this is this for me was a game changer because it helped me stay in flow state. Yeah. When I'm writing something and I have to query Google or prompt chat GPT, I'm breaking my flow and I have to, uh, from the mindset of I'm writing code uh, and I'm writing something and validating it along the way, having a quick mm -hmm. feedback cycle, I go to uh, let me see if this thing is hallucinating and if this thing is actually going to help me or browse uh, Stack Overflow and read the small sub comments that says, hey, I tried this uh, one year ago, it's, it's, not, it's not working. It, so Copilot helps me maintain flow state and it rewards me if I write in a good way. Hmm. Meaning, for example, TypeScript, you usually have to start with the types, which types kind of uh, describe your domain. You know, not, not describe your entity relationships and database relationships, but rather the the thing that I'm, hmm. I currently, I, I want to uh, implement a function that takes X and returns y, where x and y is something that I just uh, thought about. Okay. And the same thing with Python. Uh, we try to use a lot of um, uh, at 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 attributes, like the def the type classes. Yeah. Uh, we use various various uh, instruments for this. But again, you start by writing your types, and you start by writing your functions and classes. The interface. I want to I want to have this particular interface, and then Copilot kind of understands it, infers it, and helps me write the thing. And whenever it sees a pattern, if I say uh, left equals to whatever, then it will go to right equals to, and it will try to infer it. And left and right is like a very simple example, but it works with quite a lot of uh, real world domains. Yeah. And this is what I like about Copilot. And for me, this is the best tool so far if you want to have help not yeah. not it's not about only increasing productivity but rather someone thinking alongside you and helping you out to complete what you want to write true i would add that uh copilot actually helps with the mundane work uh, for example if you have to do some dto or something like that and you have a lot of work that is pretty much copy paste yeah. i'm talking from c sharp uh background now. dto is uh, data like, transfer objects yeah yeah, yeah. uh it's an object that you have to, well, we have the entity from the database and you have to return something without the entity connections yeah. uh, with the database. So what you do pretty much is create a class that is most of the time like 90% the same as the original class and you have to do it every time. And every time you have to do it, it's, it's just stupid. Most of the time you do a copy paste and remove attributes and stuff like that. And copy what like yeah. finishes it all. In, in an instant yeah i mean, I mean for me, the the fact that it rewards you for writing good code and for me good code is something that yeah. has a pattern that can be easily recognized and replicated after this is is really good because i i, I right now i, I kind of have an intuition when uh the, the copilot suggestion is just you know, stop stop, mm. stop i'm still I'm, this is not the pattern that i want i'm still thinking and I, I and I know when I have the pattern right, and then it's just complete, 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 uh, and it becomes really, really fast and really useful. 
Uh, so yeah, Copilot, uh, do, do, do you guys use it? Yeah, we use it. Uh, we've actually tried also Codium and Tab9. All right. Uh, I can talk a little about uh, a little about them because we are still in like a trial period. Okay. Um, but uh, from my experience, Copilot is also the best. I agree with you. Not only because it's uh, the first on the market, not only that, but um, it just works great. And also there is a like plugin for VS Code. Uh, I, I'm not sure where else uh, the plugin exists, but uh, you have Git, Git Pilot Chat. Uh, Copilot Chat, yeah, that's... Uh, so they have... Copilot, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think. It's fine. They have, uh, because I, I was just looking at this before before we recorded, they have GitHub Copilot, which is the plugin that's auto complete mm -hmm. stuff. And they have GitHub Copilot chat, which is another thing. Yeah. And uh, the combination of both of them is actually great because the things that we talked about earlier with ChatGPT that uh, you need to explain the code or rewrite the code, as you said, you can do, him, do them inside the IDE. Yeah. You don't have to go outside of the AD to a browser to copy paste code and so on. It's right there. It, it's really nice. Uh, I agree with you that Copilot generates good code if your code is good. Actually, from my uh, little experience with Copilot for like two months, something like that, um, I worked on a project that was very nicely written and the one that was not nicely written. Uh, Copilot for the one, the first one, the nicely written project worked really well. For the badly written one, it was it was just a distraction, so I had to turn it off. Yeah. And uh, it doesn't. It works okay if your code is okay, which is actually nice because that way you learn how to write good code, so you can be helped by these tools as you said exactly you're rewarded for good design yeah yeah i have a disclaimer to make here for me every time i mean the the mode that i'm in while writing code is pretty different than the mode i'm in while reviewing code mm. so yes. while i'm writing it's really easy for the copilot to suggest something that looks good to me right now but when i'm reviewing the code i'm oh my god did i just commit that i mean Hmm. It was not a great suggestion and it looks good to me when I was in a writing mode, but now that I'm in a reviewing mode, it's not even there. And you need to be really careful with this because that's the exact point. I'm always doing a self pull request review before asking others to review it hmm. just because I'm now in the reviewing mode. So I'm like more skeptical, challenging things more, not in the writing mode. And it's, it's tricky. It is nice to receive good su some some suggestions but when you are in a writing mode suggestions may be looking good right now and being like re really bad in two hours when you are reviewing them yeah i've been That's many times situation oh that looks good right now i'm just tap 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 yeah this function now works great and like 20 minutes after that i'm reviewing my own code and i'm oh this is <laughs> this is not even but good for pull request again my my biggest well, what's the word for it? Pet B for critique for all those tools is you should not use them uh, in s to replace your thinking. Mm -hmm. And Copilot, you know, you don't, you have to know what Copilot will suggest to you, and then just how to complete it. I think this is the proper flow state and the proper state of mind. You don't you. If you are surprised by what Copilot is suggesting to you, then perhaps Copilot will not help you as much if you are in a flow state, knowing the direction that you're going. If you are in a state of exploration and you ask Copilot, hey, how would you write this or ChatGPT, then it's okay to be surprised because this gives you a new insight, a new idea, what, what, what uh, don't you mentioned before this, but uh, at least I try to make this distinguish uh, to, to make the distinguish between between those two things. I know what Copilot is going to suggest me because I've written uh, a very good pattern to to replicate. And if Copilot started start suggesting me random stuff, then perhaps I'm still uh, figuring things out. So it should not replace thinking. And for me, this is 
the biggest downside of uh, a lot of people using it because it helps you to a certain point and then whenever it cannot help you further you're left on your own mm. and if you're left on your own and you don't have the skills to take care uh, of the code base and to think and reason through what you've produced uh you're going to be in a very bad situation true exactly yeah. We we had a uh, an anecdote. We had a client that reached out to us that said, "Hey, I have generated a Django app. It works, but I'm getting some errors. So can you um, help me out?" And through the discussions, I realized like they really needed the app to be rewritten hmm. or all done in in a different way, and uh, this client just didn't have the budget for for, for this. Hmm. and has has gotten to a point where copilot and chat gpt was producing code that was throwing runtime exceptions and then you don't have the skills to deal with this and this is for me the biggest concern that i have looking at all the young folks because we kind of have the intuition and the skills and the knowledge hmm. because we've been doing this for 13 years and more hmm. but the young folks if they think they can replace their thinking and just move fast and break things through the codes, uh, I think they're in for a very rude awakening at, at a certain point. True, true. I can agree, yeah. Yeah. AI should be used as a whole to augment your capabilities, not like replace them. Well, I guess we'll talk about this later, but yeah. yeah. Should we make a quick break, Teddy? Okay. All right. All right. So mid episode vibe check. How how are you guys feeling? Pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah. All right. We can do this for more hours. Let's do it then. Yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> so don't just hit more hours. You're getting more hours. This is it. Uh, while we were talking about the episode, you mentioned that you want to talk about deep L and Grammarly for generating documentation. So I have written this down and so uh, please, I have never heard for DeepL before you mentioned it. Grammarly, mm -hmm. we all know it, but I think it's going to be interesting insight. Well, I use them both. Uh, how to say it? Um, I use them both, uh, but for different uh, things. For example, I think I'm not speaking that uh, clear English, but I think I'm um, writing okay English. So I don't need uh, DeepL for uh, these purposes because yeah, I can, uh, write everything I want in yeah. okay English. But the good thing about DeepL is that it has an API. And that I have actually done a, like a proof of concept thing about this, that you can use it to summarize meetings. And okay, yeah, and uh, long story short, you record the meeting, you extract the transcript, that is, for example, in Bulgarian in our case, and then you give it to ChatGPT to okay. summarize it. Yeah, the problem here is that ChatGPT does not handle Bulgarian very well. So uh, you have to do an extra, extra step, like translate the transcript. Okay. And once you translate it in, uh, in English, ChatGPT performs a lot better. Uh, that's why we use DeepL. Uh, it has an API, it's not very expensive. Yeah, it's paid, you can't, I think you can't use it for free, but it's not that expensive. It's really cheap and uh, you can use it for all the meetings. All right. So basically you, you get a recording, which is an MP4 or whatever. Yeah. You throw it, throw it at Whisper. Yeah, actually. It actually, does well with Bulgarian. Actually, that, yeah, I forgot to tell you about Whisper. Mm. I use Whisper a lot. Um, actually, me and Georgi Neno from the Super Chuvekat, Superhuman yep. in English. The Superhuman podcast. Yeah. Uh, me and him done have done a like proof of concept where um, it, it's a really funny story because I was on another, another podcast and it was in his studio and sorry. Uh, I'm just uh, confirming yeah. saying yes in order yeah. to flow with the conversations. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about this. Yeah. If it's too distracting. Okay. Uh, and then I mentioned about him about uh, Whisper. 
and he was really interested because it takes him a lot of time to um, he has a very long podcast podcast for example three hours or something like that and he does these podcasts uh, every week so every week he has to listen to this podcast many many times to extract things like uh, topics and um, uh, how do you say quotes and so yeah, on and yeah. so on yeah and we've done this with him in bulgarian and um, with him i actually started using it even more in meetings and whisper x whisper actually uh, whisper is also by open ai like chat gpt uh, they don't have a service yet they have only api or only you APIs, can yeah. yeah or you can run it all locally actually that's what we have done with uh, with joro uh, works really nice with uh, bulgaria to be fair i have tried another services before that, because in the summer I had to perform a 36 degree interview with all the employees of the company. Uh, back then we were like 20 or something. Mm. And that's a lot of stuff that I have to write, write down. Okay. I wanted to do it like in a one week uh, so I can get, go out of the, um, for my job, yeah, for my work. And I tried another tools. Uh, I I don't remember them actually. There are. Okay. Yeah, but uh, since we are humans, nobody talks perfect Bulgaria, and that's a very big problem with tools like that. Because when you uh, speak with dialect, it doesn't doesn't it doesn't understand. Yeah. Uh, we have a colleague that uh, used to be a teacher, and she speaks very nice. Bulgarian, very correct grammatically. She uh, speaks the whole words and so on. Oh, perfect Bulgarian, and it understood everything uh, yes. she said. But uh, the tools didn't understand me or the other guys that the guys and gals we in, I interviewed. So uh, then I found Whisper. And Whisper actually performs really well with Bulgarian. Really well. It even has uh, like catchphrases, for example, Quo and uh, uh, Maniak. Pokazabace. Pokazabace, Maniak. Maniak. Uh, tsichkite... Sorry, <laughs> sorry. I continue we to just forget. gave some examples for what Whisper can understand from Bulgarian. Yeah, yeah which is uh, like impressive. And the thing it in Whisper is going more technical is that you can actually vote on a model that is trained with Bulgarian data. And uh, that's why it understands Bulgarian really, really nice. And I use Whisper like every day because okay. I have meetings every day, no, not like wonk meetings, but I have a lot of uh, 15 minute wonk meetings and uh, I record every meeting. How do you record them? using zoom or obs or no uh currently i use author ai if it's a short meeting okay uh it's another like ai tool it actually provides transcription out of the box but only in english yeah. and since we're talking in bulgarian i only get the recording and it extracts me a mp3 file and yeah yeah record them record the meeting get the transcript uh, it used to take a lot of time because I don't have a like ultra powerful GPU. And uh, for example, with Joro for a three hours long podcast, it took, uh, I don't know, like four hours to okay. transcribe it. Um, and four hours that I was not able to use my PC because it was like... Uh, Burning the GPU. Yeah. Yeah. Um, then I do it, did it in co-op. I don't know if you have heard of co-op, like Google co-op. Uh, never mind. Google co-op is like an online place where you can write code. All right. You can execute code in Python. Okay. And uh, it is prepared for working with uh, like um, AI. Running on Google Cloud infrastructure, I suppose. Yeah. And there you have a free GPU that is T4, which is not the best, but it's still way greater than anything you can buy at home. All right. 
And for purposes like this, uh, we we were able to decrease the time for like four hours to seven minutes or something like that. And it's really wow. nice. Yeah. Okay, so that's really smart, folks. You can uh, basically do the same thing if you are in the same situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can do it. And uh, then GPL comes in. Because as, as I said, the talk and the transcript is in Bulgarian and ChatGPT does not uh, understand Bulgarian very well. Well, it does, but not as good as in English. Because for uh, like uh, three hours long conversation, there are a lot of words yeah. and uh, you feel the context pretty fast. I think it was like 8K in ChatGPT, something like that. Or 12 or yeah, something like yeah, that. Yeah, something like that, which is like 20 minutes of talking and yeah. we're talking about three hours and here comes uh, GPL. Uh, once you translate it to GPL, uh, you get the trans transcript in English and then actually I use another tool, it's called GP Trim. I'm not sure how you pronounce it, it's not very popular, but the idea, the idea behind this is that from the transcript you can extract only the tokens. And yeah, for example, in promise, promising, you don't need the promising the whole word for ChatGPT to understand it. You need only promise, if I am not mistaken. So that's for characters saved from from this. And then you can fit the whole transcription into a context. And it actually works pretty nice. All right, so the summary is uh, you use Whisper to uh, extract the transcript from the recording. Yeah. Uh, you then uh, use uh, DeepL to translate it. Then you, you pass it through uh, GP3, GP3, which yeah. basically uh, reduce, kind of reduces the words uh, in the tokens. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, ChatGPT or the LLM behind it still understands what you're trying to say. So you can pass within the context window and then you get whatever you, you want to get out of out of this. Absolutely, yeah. So you're combining four different AI tools to, to get your work. Yeah, yeah. And nowadays it's really easy because you have the tools, you have the information, you have the, you can actually use ChatGPT and Quote to like tell you how to do it. Uh, you can use the tools them, themselves to tell you how you can use them, which is pretty amazing. But you, st you still need to have the basic uh, foundation and knowledge of actually using those tools. Because if yeah. you don't, ChatGPT will tell you and you still wonder wonder what to do. But that's actually pretty smart. And uh, this ties to, uh, we have a topic about RAG, uh, Retrieval Augmented Generation. So what you just described, I think, is basically Retrieval Augmented mm -hmm. Generation uh, use case, but with not, not with the standard tools, but we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll yeah. get there. Yeah. Awesome. That's that's really really interesting. So Georgi um, uh, Nuff is going to have uh, automated, um, how to say, not transcripts, but uh, he will, he is using the, those tools right now. Yeah, yeah, he is, and uh, I think for like two months now, something like that. Nice. And uh, we are in constant like communication if something is not working because uh, we are doing the POC with him. Uh, because, yeah, as you said, I know I have the knowledge, so I can do it myself, but it's interesting if a non-technical person can do it as well. And uh, he's helping with that. Yep. Awesome. That's really, that's really interesting. And thank you for, thank you for mentioning this. Mm -hmm. uh, awesome. And now, before we continue with more AI, um, uh, more AI topics. We have something very important to say. Uh, our podcast, uh, our YouTube channel has a specific goal. Do you know what I'm talking about? 1,000 subscribers. Is it? Is this the goal? This is the goal. We are yeah. aiming for 1,000 subscribers. And do you know what's going to happen if we get to 1,000 subscribers? You're doing a giveaway. What are we going to give away? A DAS keyboard. Oh, nice. You will do a better presentation than me, so please go ahead. Das I'll just keyboard look at the Professional camera. 6. It is a great and solid keyboard with uh, MX Brown mechanical switches that are really, really soft and sounds great. I am personally using the older model. I guess Radu is using the older model too. Yeah, that's keyboard 4. Okay, mine, mine is... Uh, four. You're, you're also using four. I'm yeah. using four pro. You're using four. Right, where you have the same keyboards. Yeah, but 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 mine is modified with a yeah. lot a lot of options in there. He's a keyboard geek. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mine is a little bit painted and 
different keycaps and so on. But but yeah, the keyboard's really good. So if you would like to participate in the giveaway. Yeah, subscribe to our channel. Once we get to a thousand subscribers, we will pick one of you out of all the thousand subscribers and we will send you this beautiful dust keyboard. And if you subscribe, you will make Teddy very happy. Uh, you will make, you will also make us happy. And the thing is we will continue uh, creating content that's actually valuable for you that can help you grow in your business or in your career. So just subscribe. Also, we post memes from time to time. Yeah, that's it. That's, that was the keyboard segment. I have one question. Can I unsubscribe and subscribe and like join the... Uh... If you are already subscribed, you are already participating. Ah, okay. You okay. will pick one of the thousand subscribers. Great, great. So Thank you me. are already participating. And if you, if, if you subscribe two times... Okay. With your business account, you know. <laughs> it raises the it odds. Counts, yeah. It raises the odds. <laughs> what, what's the keyboard that you're using, don't you? Are you a keyboard geek? Yeah, I used Evo to be. Is, I am not, so that's, that's why I'm asking. I used to be, but uh, now I have a cat and uh, my cat eats uh, keyboards. Oh, no. um, so now I remade my setup and I'm using only the laptop uh, keyboards. <laughs> but I used to have a... Uh, how, how was when it When is called? your birthday? <laughs> 20, 22nd of uh, June. Are we, are we buying him a dog? <laughs> <laughs> no, please don't. <laughs> Come on, I'm a, I'm also a cat person, but yeah, um, I used to have a black. Uh, how was it? The razor one. The uh, black the, widow. Yeah, black the black widow. Uh, I had different keyboards throughout throughout the like past few years. Uh, this is the one that I like the most, and. Uh, I use it so much that my um, like buttons stop to work. Uh, I still use it. My control was really, really hard to use. And back then I, I was using Linux and control is a very important. Like, it is. Yeah. Yeah. And still I liked it. Now, as I said, um, I, I prefer to buy laptops, uh, to work on laptops because well, we are mo more mobile these days. And uh, I just buy laptops that have uh, like premium keyboards. Do you use Mac or? Uh, Mac and Linux, yeah. Mac and, okay. and Windows for games, actually. Okay. Uh, yeah, for work, I prefer Mac because uh, it has all the nice things there. It has nice display, nice, nice keyboard. Uh, everything is nice. And it works. And it works, yeah. Um, I like Linux very, very much, but... To be fair, I didn't, I haven't had a laptop that works great with a battery on Linux. I don't know. No one did. Yeah, and this you is have to compile a bunch of additional stuff. Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, well, that's great. I also wrote your birthday, so we'll, we'll, we'll see about this. Uh, and to continue with the AI topic, something very important. Uh, now let's get to the business side of things. Since we are working with end clients, you're also working with end clients. Do your clients have any concerns about uh, privacy concerns about you using um, AI tools? For example, leaking the code. You mentioned uploading the code to Cloud, uh, which for some clients, this may sound like a privacy nightmare. Yeah. Uh, well, we discuss this with the clients and if they're not okay with it, yeah, we do it without AI. Uh, we turn off the copilot and uh, don't use ChatGPT for, for things that can be related to the project. For example, it is okay to use ChatGPT to explain something to you mm -hmm. uh, as long as it's not um, cannot be con connected exactly to the client. And by cannot be connected, I don't mean that we want to hide, but that nobody can. For example, explain... Uh, Something more framework specific and not yeah, yeah, yeah. domain specific exactly. as the domain yeah. knowledge and secrets of the client. Exactly. Or for example, some exception. If you share some exception, what? All right. Uh, what is this exception? How can I fix it? That's not specific to the client, so there should be no problem. Yeah, this is something very important to pay attention to, especially when you're working with end clients. Um, for example, we use uh, Copilot for business, which 
Uh, I have written this here. Prompts are discarded once a suggestion is returned and suggestions are not retained by GitHub. So yeah. at least this is this is covered. And we also have a very, very strict policy of uh, not copy pasting anything clients related into ChatGPT or any other AI tool. Uh, we decided to make this like a company-wide policy for now. And uh, so far, I'm not sure this this is a, like a topic that's going to be quite interesting in the coming years about who owns the code and uh, mm -hmm. all the, for example, in GitHub Copilot for Business, you can disable, uh, and we've done so, uh, you can disable public uh, suggestions from public code mm. because you might end up in, um, yeah, with using... some li licensing issues. Yeah, There were some licensing issues where Copilot just kind of generated some uh, GPL and other, other yeah. license that most of the clients are not happy uh, having this code in their code base. So this is really important and it's an, uh, it's an interesting topic for, for how this is going to unfold and turn out. Okay. I guess this is going to become a nightmare at some point. You can right now steal code without knowing that you're stealing it. You can just get a suggestion and this suggestion may be something that's copyrighted or something that has a license that does not just allow you to, to get for, the For music. Copilot, you can disable this. Yeah. Can for Copilot, yeah, you can. There can, is an option about it. Can you rely on 100% that I it works? Whatever, you know, 100%, no. But uh, also, uh, OpenAI ChatGPT, you can disable, like you can say, uh, if you are using the API, at least they say they are not uh, mm. using the data for training, if you can trust them. Yeah. And right now, for the subscription version, you can disable, for example, I have disabled... Um, the history, the yeah. prompts. So every time right, we start yeah. with, with a new prompt, which is not always optimal, but that's why sometimes just copy paste the result in, in stack and then when we, we use this. But uh, privacy, I think it's going to be really important. And my suggestion to all of you, if you are using this and working with client projects, read the privacy statements of the tools that you use. They have one. And just make sure your clients are okay with mm. the privacy statements from uh, those tools, because otherwise you may be walking in a very, very bad situation where uh, legal fees can be really high. And speaking of clients, uh, okay, let's let's go there, and then we'll we'll finish with we'll finish with something else. And speaking uh, speaking of clients, have you actually done any kind of AI implementations, for example, working with Open with ChatGPT's API or something else for 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 a particular client for a project? Still no, uh, but uh, we get a lot of requests that want AI because <laughs> AI now is the hype. Mm -hmm. So, for example, we get a project description that uh, goes through our PM, and she says that those are the requirements, and then want AI, and I'm like, what they want AI for? right uh doesn't matter we just want ai so we can write it down and uh use something like i know notes with ai or whatever we haven't um uh, i have tried it uh, as i said with the uh the whole transcription meeting things i have tried it out i can't wait to have a quote say quote the other chat chatbot mm. to have um, their API available in Bulgaria so I can use it. Right. Uh, currently, it's uh, limited to only to UK and US. Okay. And yeah, we can use the chatbot, but I want to use the API and I can't. I want to try it because they have very big contacts. Like they have uh, 100K context uh, for the API, which is huge. You can send a lot of things there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, have you? I think so, yeah. Yeah, we have some some projects that are internally right. using some some AI APIs. And actually, right. um, in running in production for clients, so I remember you used um, OpenAI for parsing and generating structured data. Yes, out of a free text parse, out of a product description parse, uh, yeah. and give me a structured data. What is the brand? What is the um, product name what is the product nice. uh, yeah. identifier so nice. on and so forth which which worked really well actually yeah to our surprise it worked really really well and we have uh, a couple more clients uh, where we basically implemented something that that's called rack retrieval augmented generation mm -hmm. which is basically 
hey, I have some data and I want to be asking questions towards that data. And the data usually is like 20 pages, uh, 20 pages PDF or mm. 200 pages of PDF and or, or so, something like this. And the implementation kind of follows the standard rack uh, implementations where uh, we used, I think, Langchain uh, for, for both with the popular Python library mm. for, for doing retrieval augmented generation. And the general idea is if you can upload 200 pages PDF in ChatGPT and ChatGPT can use this as a context, then you can ask questions mm. around this context, but the context window is much, much smaller. But so if you want to do this, you have to first chunk your PDF into smaller parts and store the vector embeddings in a vector database for which you can use open AIs. Uh, they have an API, which you give them text and they just return you floating points, mm. which is the vector representation of the text. And then you can store, basically trans tr transfer the text into vector format, format and store this vector format in a vector database. Uh, those became quite popular, mm. of course, recently, uh, like Pinecoin and, or just you can, you can use Postgres for this. And this is what you are always doing. If you want to have uh, like search optimization, if you want to have like auto suggestions and, uh, fast search, uh, and for example, store the data in Postgres, you use the vector, the vector mm. fields in Postgres and you use some of the vectorization formats for the text. So here you chunk. The, the, the documents, turn it into vectors, store, store it in vector database. And then what you're doing is basically whenever the user asks a question, for example, write some kind of text, you again, obtain the vector format from open AI. You do a, uh, search in the vector database, basically get me the neighboring vectors with the same, uh, with the same meaning, get some of the context out, out of the, uh, vector database and send this context within the context window to chat GPT and then get answers on your, on your document. And they're like quite a lot of implementations. You can basically ask chat GPT 10 times and refine it each, hmm. each of the times. Uh, it's a, it's really interesting pro um, engineering problem to solve because there is no single solution that just works. You have to fiddle a lot with how do you chunk, what kind of vector database are you using? How much are you refining? And <laughs> the end result is you get answers over the data that you have over your private data that you have. So those are implementations that we've done two okay. implementations, three, but different each time because nice the context is different and uh we will share we have some resources but basically long chain is a thing that we've been using and it's a python library with a lot of mm. tooling around this oh, yeah Great. and that way you can chat with your documentation which is extremely nice <laughs> yeah it sounds really nice it takes a lot of effort in order to make it actually usable yeah. otherwise you you get you get strange results you get strange results mm -hmm. and there's a lot of prompt engineering that you need to do mm. all right so let's talk about the human side of things and with this we can we can wrap we can wrap the episode i have i have a topic here about burnout and I've been thinking a lot about burnout, uh, especially in the context of AI. And I have the following question. If those tools are making us more productive as software engineers, does this mean that we will be burning out way more because usually non-technical people, how they reason about things, Oh, you can use AI to do this five times faster. I want five times more performance out mm. of you. Just use AI in order to obtain that performance. And this will surely produce a lot of, uh, how to say pressure towards software engineers to be, 
uh, more predictive when the tools, yes, they make you more predictive, but it's not like a magic wand where mm -hmm. everything is just happening. So what's your view on that? Yeah, I was thinking about that. I was thinking about that a lot because I would say that not, uh, not that somebody expects you to do a lot more, um, but how to say it? Well, you are, when you are solving a problem, we talked actually about that a little. When you're solving a problem, there is interesting stuff like engineering stuff and there is mundane work, mundane work. something that you just have to write. And yeah, it may, may be boring, you may be uh, tiresome and so on, but you are not thinking it because um, you just have to do it. And this way your mind can rest for, for it. And using ODI tools, if this work is done for you, Copilot or uh, Tab9 or ChatGPT doesn't matter. If all of this is done for you automatically, you don't have this rest time. So you're always like thinking. Um, that's my thoughts. I'm I'm not sure if uh, the burnout will uh, burn, burnout rates will increase. Uh, I think they are pretty high right now. <laughs> they are. So yeah, <laughs> uh, but. I think that, uh, I know you can use the, the time left because yeah, when you use, uh, AI, you are more productive. I would not say five times, like, as you said, like people managers want it to be, yeah. but more like 20 to 30%, something like that. Uh, but you can use this time to like rest and by rest, I don't mean drink coffee and uh, smoke you, we do this anyway, uh, but to like rest your mind and uh learn new things uh, as uh, evil said like review your code something like that that is yeah it's intense work but it's not as intense on, as uh, writing the algorithm mm. uh, that solves the problem so i hope i hope that ai won't increase the burnout rates but you never know it's pretty new we have to see about it I can definitely see the point that if you are like relaxing a little while doing rep the repetitive work, mm. sometimes you just know what to do. You just have to do it. It takes three hours. So for three hours, you're just straight coding, knowing what you need to do. If in the coming, if in the upcoming months, we have less and less such a work because the AI is doing it, that means that like most of our days, we are going to do heavy thinking and yeah. way more exhausting work. That's not repetitive. That is like the, the core of software development. I can definitely see how this is going to lead you to a burnout because you can't be like eight hours a day, hundred percent, just thinking mm -hmm. and not doing any repetitive work. Uh, my, my, my even biggest concern is that there is so much new information about AI, new, new researches, new papers, new, new, new products are releasing basically every day that if you're trying to keep up to date with them and, uh, uh, read basically almost everything, not almost everything, but if you're trying to be on the cutting edge about AI, I don't think that's even possible right now. Yeah, It's so much information that I sometimes get tired of reading and uh, exploring different tools. And I'm like, you know what? I'm closing everything. I will check in two weeks. If the situation is still the same, then good. If it's not, I guess someone is going to, to tell me there's something new and big out there. In one of the clients that we are working, there is a full-time person that is reading papers and investigating what is going on here and there and okay. posting the important information in the chat so we can, we can consume, but it is a startup towards AI. So that's kind of important for them. Yeah, okay. And there are a lot of new things going out like almost every day. Yeah, new, absolutely. New models, new, new, new articles with a lot of information, new researches, a lot of things. Absolutely. As with everything else, I think it's just a lot of, there is a lot of FOMO, like fear of missing out uh, in the software engineering space. And my biggest problem is that your, the AI that you're using, your co-pilot will maintain the pace that you maintain. It mm -hmm. can run, it can go slow. It's just moving with your pace. And sometimes the thing that's missing is something to actually slow you down and pace you like when you're running you can just run like crazy for 
for a lot of time you, you need to you need to be pacing yourself and i think it's the same way it's working and ba especially software engineering sometimes you need to pace yourself because otherwise uh you will just burn yourself out and the my other concern is all the toxic managers that will push people uh to perform more because there's ai now like you have no excuse not to ship this thing this week because come on just use ai and i've heard such things and that's why that's why i'm raising i i, I don't have a good answer for the question it's just just uh, something to think about mm, absolutely yeah. absolutely and moving so on the human side of things uh a bit more philosophical do you think ai will eventually replace us not as humans but let's scope it down to software engineers yeah, that's very philosophical. I would say that in short term, no. In short term, I mean like a couple of uh, decades, maybe. Uh, now, AI cannot replace a human, well, at least for most of the things. Yeah, AI helps a lot in explaining code, as we said, in transcribing, um, actually in speaking. There is a research, as you, as you said about the research, I'm... Um, a long time ago, I just decided I can do all the research, so I do some of them. But there is a research uh, that uh, I don't remember the name of the company. They're working with Spotify and they have created uh, an AI that can uh, actually replace trans uh, translated uh, podcasts. So we are speaking in English and now but maybe in two years we can spe be speaking in plain bulgarian and still have the uh, podcast in english pen and and so on and so on and that's what one thing that you can see as a replacement for like uh, translators because if you have on the go translation of uh, languages uh, it comes a question why do you need a translator right uh, like a person translator so i think that in the future a lot of jobs will disappear yeah uh, they will be replaced by ai mm -hmm. and uh, some jobs will be adapted it's actually throughout history uh, there are always jobs that just disappear for example we no more have uh, like people manually rowing the field right yeah we have uh, like machines doing that and machines upgrading and so on. We haven't ceased to exist, but the, these people have to adapt. So you have to adapt to the tools and you have to learn how to use them. And in my opinion, it's uh, important to adapt to them as early as possible because this way uh, you are ahead of everything else it's it's much like in 2007 i think something like that that we had uh, google google started to be yeah. yeah if you can use google you're way ahead um before other like people your, your age and it's the same thing here well in in much uh, higher uh, higher scale yeah but still you have to learn what will happen in 50 years? I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. Yeah. Anybody knows. Yeah, I'm kind of, I have the same line of thinking. I, I still cannot see how AI will replace the human that needs to know how to prioritize, know the domain, have the intuition, have the drive and motivation mm -hmm. to make things happen. Like all of those skills are ex still extremely important and even more important now that you have tools that can help you generate and write some of the code. Uh, now, if we get to a point where we have AGI, which is like artificial general intelligence, which is basically indistinguishable from human, then perhaps bad things will happen, but uh, software engineering will not be the only uh, profession that will suffer. I think the entire human yeah. race will suffer. So uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah it's course. just going to be something different, but I'm not sure we're there yet uh but we will just continue looking at looking at things for sure the tools help us as software engineers but they help us because we know what we are looking for and we kind of know what we are expecting as outcome and 
you still have to learn the basics. You still have to learn the foundation of whatever you do in order to leverage uh, those AI tools. For me, those AI tools help the most people who have a lot of skills and experience. Mm, mm. Like there, this is where they they shine. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And all right. And the last question for for the podcast. How do you rest and recharge? We are on the human side of things. Uh, well, I have primarily three hobbies. Uh, that's what I, uh, the things I do is I read, I uh, play games and uh, I, how do you say, uh, I like Lego. So I'm like, uh, you're building stuff, with building, Lego. building stuff with Lego. Yeah. Uh, to be fair, I have to like skip the Lego part because as I said, I have a cat and the cats don't like Lego and I need to have um, specific furniture built uh, with like doors, like glass doors, so the cat cannot go inside and ruin the Legos. Uh, so I pretty much play games and read. Of course, I watch a lot of movies. I like to research things. All right. To be fair, uh, to be honest, actually, to be honest, uh, researching about technology sometimes uh, helps me rest. Uh, it's casual researching. It's not like there's no pressure. I have to do this because a client wants or it's needed at work. It's just casually checking things out. All right. It actually helps a lot. What kind, what kind of games are you playing? Uh, as we started, we are young, we are not that old, but I like the StarCraft 2 and uh, uh, Diablo 2. Uh, actually, me and my uh, colleague, Ivao Kenl, the CEO of the company, we sometimes uh, make our meetings, like discussing things about the company in the office playing StarCraft. And we play StarCraft 2 and between games, we we like... You play 2v2? Yeah. All right. Yeah, we do. Wait a minute. So while you're having the meeting, you're playing StarCraft? Uh, no, no, no. Not at, at the exact same time. Okay. In the rest between the meetings or the games, it depends on how you look at, at things. Okay, okay. We are making the meeting. So for example, playing a game that's 20 minutes, then 20 minutes we're discussing something, then we're playing another game and so on and so on. Nice. What yeah. races are you playing? Uh, I prefer playing Zerk. All right. But since he's, he plays Zerk as well, um, I'm trying to learn Proto so we can be like better because two Zerks can do anything. <laughs> yeah. Send yeah. the probe, build the pylon. Yeah. And enjoy the, the cannon rush. Yeah. Awesome. We we also used to, to play a lot of StarCraft 2, I think. Really? Uh, yeah. Yes. Back in the days. Back in the days, we played a lot of StarCraft 2. I think we even got to something like Master in 3v3. Uh, because we were exploiting a lot. Yeah. And well, great. Yeah. <laughs> Marine rush for the win. <laughs> <laughs> Everything nice. that that could be exploited, we were exploiting it. Nice. Uh, but I think right now in our company, the game of choice is League of Legends. But I, okay, I'm too old for this. I'm now. too old for this. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, Doncho, thank you very much for your time. I think the discussion was really interesting. I hope everyone uh, could actually learn and benefit from from what we talked about. You are. It was a great talk with you. I personally uh, learned a couple of things, so I put them down. Yeah. Uh, I, I think we are going to steal the to, to steal the idea for transcribing the podcast. Uh, it can help right. us a lot, yeah. Teddy. <laughs> it can help yeah. Teddy a lot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right for sure. And uh, thank you for watching. This is Hackcast Season Four. We are going to have guests every episode, and for the first episode, of course, we had Doncho. Thank you very much, Doncho. Thank you very much as well. It was really nice talking about things. I have also learned things, so I haven't written them down, but I'll ask you for it later. And one last thing. Can you please ask our viewers to subscribe to our channel? Subscribe to the channel of the Hackcast uh, and you can learn, uh, you can earn a very nice keyboard. Thank you very much. That's all. Bye-bye.